Hi guys, I'm Jo Croft. You are listening to the Puppy Coach Podcast. Join me as I share my top tips, thoughts and experiences from my career as a vet nurse and canine behaviour specialist, helping owners form a strong, safe relationship with their dog. Okay, so for today's podcast, I wanted to visit the subject of socialisation. Um, given the situation that we've had with the pandemic of late, I'm seeing more and more cases where socialisation learning has been a problem. Uh, either dogs haven't had enough or they haven't had the right type of socialisation. So let's consider what is socialisation. So it's really a process of learning to get the animal to behave in a way that's acceptable in society. So they need to be safe, they need to be well-mannered, they need to be listening to their owner's instructions. And obviously we want to be trying to achieve that by linking positive associations with their experiences. So this is why we look at always trying to have something fun to mark the dog's good positive behaviour. So food or praise from an owner or play or something where the dog has a really nice fun time. Positive socialisation is obviously down to the perception of the dog and also the owner. And I think one of the things that I really focus in on when I look at educating my owners is trying to get them to understand how the dog sees things and how the dog responds to certain situations. Our perception of our dogs having a fun time isn't always the same as the dogs. So if we look at the majority of dogs in social spaces and how they interact with each other, you'll often see some what we would class as overexcitable behaviour, hyperactive behaviours, lots of chase behaviours, maybe the dogs are jumping on each other, maybe there's lots of panting, lots of barking, Parking. If I see that going on in a public park, I don't necessarily perceive that as being a great way of teaching your dog to interact socially on a positive platform. I see that as dogs learning poor behaviours, as being potentially over threshold, maybe reactive, and actually just looking for ways of coping within that social environment rather than actually enjoying the experience. That doesn't mean you shouldn't let your dogs play. Of course, your dogs need to be playing and interacting with each other. And I generally find the best way to do this is to actually buddy up with another dog who's more experienced, who's more confident, where the dog can actually walk alongside them. They can visualize how that dog interacts with other dogs. They can periodically interact in play. They can chase each other around, but then you should get the dog stopping and just plodding along again a bit more normal. That's perfectly fine for the dog to do. And if you're looking at your little puppy and how they are interacting, that would come out as a really positive learning experience. The most important thing that you'll see with that is that the puppy should be able to retreat or walk away or have time alone from the other dog in order to just reset or just look at the situation and go back into it if they want to. As we're talking about puppies, I think it's important to consider the development stages of the puppy um, and where socialisation is extremely important and where you lose your window to actually be able to teach your dog within social situations in a positive way at all. So as soon as you get your puppy, you want to be thinking about what situations do I have in my life that I'm going to want my dog to interact with on a positive platform to be able to cope with or to be able to sit and watch and observe. So if you like to do lots of running if you like to play sports and you have team sports so your your puppy may end up as an adult dog wanting to be with you when you're at rugby matches or football matches with the kids if you do a lot with bikes bikes can be a big trigger for the dog's reactivity or prey drive or chase drive behaviors so you'll want to be socializing your puppy around these things in a really calm way so that they learn to just accept them avoid them or ignore them After the four to four and a half month period, your puppy goes into a stage of development called avoidance. And at this time, they start to find things being a little bit scary. They become a little bit more cautious and they become much more intolerant of new situations. Your window to teach your puppy new things has closed. And at this point, I'm usually looking at dogs that I'm having to counter condition to situations to actually manage behaviours. Poor behaviours may have already started to develop or the adolescent dog may just not be willing to want to interact at all. So from your learning with your puppy, you need to be watching their communication. You need to be able to understand when your puppy is stressed, when they're happy, when they've had enough, and actually considering where their tolerance levels lie. 
So puppies that haven't been socialised well and haven't seen much beyond the scope of their own home or their own little social world are generally quite withdrawn or fearful or potentially defensive. So you may see, particularly as they hit the adolescent period, some quite reactive behaviours, potentially borderline aggression as well. They become very intolerant of being picked up or handled or touched or even sometimes strangers just walking into their space. So the consequences of not exposing your puppy to good social experience can be actually very extreme and be life-changing for an owner and pretty much keep me busy with regards to rehabilitating these dogs so that they're safe and active in, in normal human social spaces. From a health perspective, obviously we need to be within the realms of the veterinary direction. So they will always say to you that your puppy needs to be managed very carefully with regard infectious diseases until they've had their full quota of vaccinations, which is usually around the 12-week mark. At that point, their critical learning period is closing. So the kind of early association stuff that we we really want our puppy to be seeing, um, any experiences that they don't get at this point, it's very, very hard for them to actually make easy, positive associations with this as they get older. So even though your puppy is not allowed to go out into big open spaces with unknown dogs and obviously avoid water and, and big environments, you should still be looking at ways where you can expose your puppy to things that they are going to see later down the line. So even if you have to pick them up and they just sit as active observers, if you um, want to travel them in the car, if you want to let them meet other dogs that are vaccinated, known dogs that you socialise with regularly, these are all really positive things. You can do loads at home as well. So you can introduce them to prams, you can introduce them to bikes. If you've got a garden, that's ideal because you can then move these things around the garden while the puppy just sits and watches. So you really need to be making a checklist and kind of ticking off on your checklist all the things that your puppy is going to need to be exposed to in order for them not to find these things scary into adult life. The other consideration is always to be mindful that dogs are hunter-gatherers. They go on their walk in a productive way. What they don't do is stand around static with groups of people um, and other dogs. So you need to be mindful that when you walk your dog, you keep the walk progressive. As I said earlier, using a buddy dog is brilliant for this. Walking into a field and just throwing a ball or standing still with a cup of coffee and lots of other dogs is probably the exact time when your puppy is going to be learning lots and lots of negative behaviours. They're going to be running into other owners, maybe receiving treats from other owners. They'll be running into other dogs or they may be being bullied by other dogs. And if you're busy chatting and having conversations with other people, then it's likely that you'll miss the early cues of your puppy being stressed. So please be mindful that if you're putting your dog in these situations, they should be very controlled circumstances you should be inviting your puppy back to you on a regular basis if you feel like your puppy's being bullied by another dog it's always a good idea just to get the other owner just to pop a lead on that other dog and watch what your puppy does if your puppy runs back to you or runs away clearly the interaction wasn't positive if he goes back in to want to play and chase again then he was having a great time so that's a really nice top tip just for you to decide whether the social interaction is good for your puppy or not when you put your puppy in social situations this is where you need to be quietly watching what they're doing. Your puppy will be talking to you all of the time. So if you're watching what they're saying and you're picking up on their early body language cues, you'll be able to react appropriately and pull them out of situations. You might find they're absolutely comfortable with three, four, five, six or seven dogs. But by the time 10 dogs have walked past, your puppy is now over threshold and either hyper excitable or wants to run away. So this is a working time for you and your dog. This is not a time that you should be kind of sitting back and just thinking about wearing your puppy out on the walk. It's always a time where you're thinking about actively socialising them and teaching them good learnt behaviours alongside their socialisation, which will carry them through into adulthood. So we'll just move on to considering children as a part of the dog's socialisation. Now, obviously, not everybody has children and not everybody has access to children, but there are still ways where you can socially expose your puppy to the behaviour of children safely from a distance. And this is still a really important learning curve for your puppy as it goes into adulthood. Children are very, very unpredictable. They're often very loud. Um, they can be very much keeping life on their terms and might come running towards your dog and then turn and run away. They might make contact, they might not. 
So often the dog's body language kind of delivers, I'm not interested. They might choose avoidance by looking away or turning their head or, head or even backing off behind their owner. But these are behaviours that are not going to be observed by a child. They're going to be ignored and children will continue to approach. So being confident enough to actually turn around and step in front of your puppy and protect them from this level of interaction outdoors will be really important for them so that they can actually rely on you and trust that you'll help them cope within these social scenarios. Taking your new puppy out into new environments, you need to be prepped. So if you're going to turn up with all your children, your entire family and bikes and footballs and picnics and your brand new puppy, you're very likely to find yourself in trouble pretty quickly. So I would always recommend that you find your first experience of taking your puppy to the park as a quiet time. Know where you're going, plan your walk Add in some social structure. So if you're going to arrive at the park with your car, then just sit with the car boot open and sit with your puppy for a bit first just to let them adjust to the environment. Give them normal controls that you would do at home, whether that's a sit and a wait before they come out of the boot just so that they've got some familiar cues to follow and you can get some good early positive reinforcement in with your treats or some play. Your first experience at the park for the puppy needs to be fun. So you're looking to have that little bit of quiet time away from everything going on and just have some fun activity with your puppy so that they get to settle in the environment. When you start your walk, it's really important to consider what you might bump into or who you might bump into. Many people have their dogs off lead running, but if you see somebody with a dog coming towards you on lead, then your puppy must also have a lead attached as well and be by your side. That's just pleasant etiquette that you that you need to be considering. Just because your puppy's good with other dogs, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else's dog is going to be good with your puppy. So that's the first point to consider. Also, parks can be unpredictable environments in that on nice sunny days, you might have lots of people out with their children and picnics and lots of things going on. And on more rainy days, they're a lot quieter. So consider what you are walking into and how you're going to approach each situation. So I I like to get my clients just to take these things in bite-sized chunks so that they don't fail. So it might be that the first day you turn up at the park, you turn up at the park in your car, you spend 10 minutes there having a nice time and you go home. The fact that your puppy has been out in a busy social environment with lots of visual and auditory stimulus, lots and lots of things to smell and lots and lots of listening to do with you means they'll be tired quite quickly. So you don't need to be running them off lead for hours and hours at a time just to try and tire them out. And actually you will find that's mostly counterproductive because your your puppy will then get overtired and start to produce adrenaline and cortisol to try and cope and as a result become over aroused and your whole training session will become unpredictable productive. So just to touch briefly on pandemic and the impact that that's actually had on her dogs, the majority of the cases that I'm now currently seeing are dogs that have lost this social period and I'm actually having to counter condition them, teaching them new things in new environments. So it's almost new learning rather than the kind of early sponge led learning. I like to call my puppies little sponges um, because it's all brand new and basically everything that you're given at that point is gifted. So the behaviours that your puppy does when they're young, you want to be reinforcing everything that's good and initially ignoring everything that's bad so we don't get to a situation where we have to correct the dog at all. Last year they reported 1,700 dog attacks in the UK alone as a result of the 2020 pandemic. Now that's an increase that's becoming significant across the board and actually something that I am seeing in my day-to-day work is seriously worrying and I think getting these early learning the social structure right the routine the understanding the dog and being very open-minded about the approaches that you use and that's going to be very bespoke to your dog and their breed is really important to ensure that you raise the most well-behaved dog that you can. So let's consider how we do this with regards to to socializing effectively and I think Teaching the basic foundations before you even leave the house or invite anybody into your house is going to be the focus for most dog owners. So having simple things in place like a little safe zone for the dog, like a well-conditioned bed so that the dog knows to go to the bed and they might sit there and, and chew on a Kong or a stag bar or something fun. If the dog is already doing these behaviors before people enter your home or before you take your puppy to another another environment, then they're going to be normal and familiar for them. So 
you can be pulling on those foundations all of the time. You can't expect to be teaching your puppy or your adult dog new commands and new situations to be in and teaching them and expecting them to cope if you've just not laid the foundations of your relationship. The dog's memory develops by a series of imprinting. So this is a biochemical process stimulated by sight and smell. So each time your puppy experiences something again and again and again, you want to make sure that the behavior he's doing or she's doing is the correct behavior that you want. If you're consistently reinforcing poor behaviors or letting your guests be overzealous with your puppy and excite them and get them into a state of arousal that you can't control, then your puppy is going to link those sights and smells together along with the behavior And that's what your puppy will do, regardless of whether they're interacting with an adult or a baby or a toddler or another animal. This also applies to livestock. And when training around livestock, it is absolutely essential that you've got full physical control at all times. And if you're in any doubt at all over your dog's behavior or whether you can handle your dog, then you need to be seeking professional help. If your dog is a puppy, this is when you want to get them out and about and attaching stop, sit and watch commands. Livestock are often prey animals, so sheep and horses and cattle, they will run if challenged. So your dog's chase instinct is going to be triggered very, very quickly. And trust me, once your dog feels that buzz of chasing after a livestock, you are not going to be able to turn that around very easily. And you are certainly not going to be able to turn that around by waving a piece of chicken or calling them or even throwing a ball in the opposite direction. You will absolutely need professional help if you are in this situation. So just in addition to this podcast, I just wanted to invite one of my clients who's contacted me recently, Emma. Hi, Emma. Hello. Um, She is about to purchase a new German Shepherd puppy. Um, So I just wanted her to just jump on and ask me some questions that she felt would be pertinent to getting her dog ownership right um, and what she might want to know around socialization, how important it is and how to go about doing it. Fire away, Emma. So we've um, always had German Shepherds and I grew up with German Shepherds. The main thing I wanted to ask really is we know a lot of people who have got puppies and don't really do any of the behaviour side or just bring them into the home and they kind of imply that you can, they can learn on the job sort of thing yeah. where they just come in and they, and they learn naturally how, what the order of things is and it's all quite easy. You know, you have the typical thing of it's like a a starter child, really, that they just come in and you can inherently raise them. You've been involved with my childhood dog, Sheba, and she's amazing and really well balanced and everything. But I know that that doesn't come without hard work. Lots of people we know who who have that attitude, they don't particularly have the the most well balanced dogs and they, they come into issues and then they often find later on that they have to do crisis management. So I just really wanted to kind of open up the conversation with you of your experience how important it is to actually get in with a puppy early and do this socialization and put the hours in and what the consequences are if you weren't to do that I mean firstly there are dogs out there that it does just happen for you know there will be lots of people listening to this maybe who have had dogs in the past and they've just been great and you know there are dogs that dogs are the most adaptable species on the planet so there are certainly dogs that will cope they'll know to take themselves away but I think that's the minority and I certainly think with some of our very finely tuned and highly strung breeds and certainly the the popular breeds at the moment the cavapoos cockapoos labradoodles I think they're already in conflict with themselves genetically so without actually having some direction from an owner they really do struggle so it doesn't just happen I'm about to get my new puppy, as you know, and I'm actually petrified because I think I know too much now. And it does put you in situations with people that that are quite difficult. And I know for sure that I will struggle. And I know that my clients struggle with some of my advice because you have to be quite outspoken about what you want with your puppy and how you want people to interact with your puppy. Your puppy comes home on day one or two. It's just come away from the litter. It's just getting to know you and you suddenly have two or three friends around to come and meet your puppy and they're all over that dog. Not reading any body language signs because at that point everything's very subtle. The puppy's new, might not be delivering things that are clear at all. So you can ruin your brand new dog within just the first week of their arrival by just creating a traumatic experience that to you was just a guest coming around and saying hi. So I think having 
a nice quiet intro into your home, having that nice quiet safe zone and allowing time. So one of the big things that people never do is allow their dog's time to adjust to a change in the environment. So somebody leaving or somebody arriving is a really big deal to a dog. Like that kind of change in their social dynamic is quite hard hitting. They're quite responsive to it. So just appreciating that and allowing the dog to be on the outskirts of a social situation, but be able to hear, see and smell everything is really important. There is a big argument for whether or not you should be letting your guests treat your puppy or reward your puppy. I'm not a big fan of it. I actually do the opposite. I like my dogs to be in my space receiving positive reinforcement in the form of treats and praise and play from me whilst my friends and family are around. Um, I own in Labradors and you with your German Shepherd will not want your big kind of 30 to 45 kilo dog jumping all over your friends and family, even if it is because they just want to play and say hi. So setting those parameters when they're young and allowing the dog to just be in the environment on a bed, or if you can't control a bed command easily, then even using a crate environment. And I know they're controversial for many reasons. They're also brilliant for controlled training. It just allows your puppy to be in the social situation, but not be overwhelmed by it. And I think that's the key word. The majority of the dogs that I see for poor behaviours now are or have been massively overwhelmed within social situations, have clearly delivered stress signals that have been missed. And as a result, they're now either completely shutting down or they're fearful or they're defensive or they're massively what we would term as over social, which I just think is hyperactive and over aroused. Either way, all these things are poor behaviours that now we need to counter condition the dog out of. I think that as well, during the pandemic, I know for us, our decision to get a puppy was we have to do it after the pandemic because we knew that the puppy would be so isolated with us and that would have been not great for its development for it to just be stuck with us and then suddenly as it's it's an adolescent having all these new experiences that it then has to deal with so quickly I don't know if you found that dog owners at the moment have been having that problem yeah hugely and I think as I mentioned earlier in the podcast I think the development phases we just don't or owners don't pay enough attention to those you know in human beings those development phases of children are really obvious and over a prolonged period of time you have the baby period the toddler period you know the early schooling period and then obviously the big one hard hitting will be at the adolescence phase which is years And in our dogs, it's only windows of time that we actually have to make their learning a productive platform for them. And if we look at most of the learning that goes on, dogs are amazing at adapting and being able to cope with situations that that I look at and think, wow, I don't know how that dog's even dealt with that. Why is your dog not aggressive? You know, going to houses where dogs are hyperactive and over aroused and they're problematic because of it. But I'm looking at them thinking, why have you not bitten someone? Because, yeah. you know, they're, bless them, they're screaming out for support and screaming out for some sort of direction over what am I supposed to do and where am I supposed to go in this social situation, not being given it and just trying to love everybody and please everybody. Yeah. You know, so you have those dogs that are trying their hardest not to be aggressive. Then you have dogs that have just been pushed beyond all ability to cope or potentially have faced some sort of trigger trauma when they were very, very young that's that's now been hardwired, which essentially means you can never get it out of their neurological system. It is in there. And now we have really serious problematic behaviours that make the dog unsafe. You know, we have to start becoming aware that the biggest killer of dogs is behaviour problems. Mm. And, and that's, you know, my comment on vaccinations earlier in the podcast you know yes we need to be very mindful about infectious diseases and vaccination times and making sure puppies immune systems are robust but actually it's not infectious diseases that kills our dogs it's their poor behaviors their inability to be able to cope living with people and here in the UK we generally don't just chuck our dogs out on the street because if people don't want them they rehome them or they drop them at a charity's door Mm. so You know, these dogs are then in another system whereby it's down to the decision of the charity what the dog's demise or positive outcome will be, which is very sad. As someone who's an expert and can read dog behaviour so clearly, I know for the layperson, 
Um, you might see a lot of videos online, for example, or a lot of scenarios where the um, as an owner, I might think that that dog is happy or enjoying themselves and actually they're in a lot of distress, even as a puppy. So what would you say are kind of some early warning signs to look out for in terms of their mannerisms or their behaviour? I think extremes are always a good consideration. So everything from, you know, if I walk into a home and the dog or puppy, if we're looking at puppy behaviour, is there and I'm being greeted by that puppy, that's a really good opportunity for me to see that puppy's mentality around human beings. And often anything around the front door is unbalanced, not particularly pleasant. And I often get told, you know, just say hi. Once you've said hello, and once you've, you know, greeted greeted the dog, then it will, will be fine and the dog will settle down. But actually that's really loading that dog with responsibility and the responsibility of my arrival. And where's its support network? They're halfway down the hallway chatting and laughing. This poor dog doesn't know who I am doesn't know whether I'm a friend or an enemy, whether I'm staying or going. So I think, you know, observing your individual dog's behaviour in the situations that you put them in is really important. You've got everything from simple stress cues, from, you know, just avoidance behaviours, looking away, ducking their head, dropping their ears, dropping their tail, not wanting to interact, as opposed to being very overt, panting, jumping up, mouthing, chucking toys at people, you know, running and getting toys. Running and getting food is another good one. A lot of my terriers will run to a food bowl and grab a, a mouthful of biscuits and then chuck it down on the, the living room really? floor in front of me. Yeah, <laughs> hilarious. I had a, a little Jack Russell terrier that would just be lovely with people coming in and everybody would greet this dog and it would all be lovely and then you'd walk in and sit down and then he'd come and lay by you and roll over and have his tummy stroked and as soon as you touched his stomach he would bite people and he'd bitten like three people oh my God. and that 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 was just going from a dog who's hugely overwhelmed with the social interaction buzzing off of adrenaline and cortisol trying to get some sort of predictability going then when everything calms down actually saying I'm not really very comfortable here going into submission it wasn't a belly rub the dog wanted at all the dog was actually delivering the most basic submissive body language signal that you can have but the owners when they do it it's all fine they can rub the dog's belly a stranger is not permitted to do so so watching out for all your own dog's communicators is really important not everybody else's dog different breeds are slightly different they have different tail carriages if you're looking at a tail you would look at it at the base not the tip because some dogs naturally carry the tip of their tail very high but if you look at their base and that's kind of bolt upright, that's a pretty confident dog. But what is the rest of the dog doing? Yeah. And is that a smoke screen? So the other thing to really bear in mind is if behaviours have gone on for a period of time and your dog has initially delivered stress behaviours or avoidance behaviours that you have missed, they get eradicated. So you can put the same frightened, nervous um Part of dog or puppy lacking in social skills into the same situation three or four times and eventually you won't get any avoidance behaviors you won't get any of the low level stuff you will just get naught to 60 half a second reactivity mm. which is usually sadly at the point that i'm called in i'm not called in at the point where the dog is quiet shutting down turning away the dog often is forced into the situ situation and the expectation is the more we do it, the easier it will be for you, which is massively incorrect. I was listening to somebody else's podcast, actually, earlier in the week about social experiences. And she was saying that there was a dog that was frightened of balloons. And she'd heard of another trainer that in order to get the dog over this fear, he'd tied something like 20 helium balloons oh my God, that's awful. to the dog's collar. This is a method called flooding, which... I don't know, it probably still is used now. It's certainly not, not something that I would consider using. So essentially, it's about forcing the animal into a situation until they do all the kind of panic response behaviours. They can't get away, nothing works, so they just collapse. And the scary thing about that is that it's a chemical collapse. So we would call that a dorsal vagal shutdown. So you are talking about literally mental damage to an animal. But the visual expectation will be that the dog is calm and quiet yeah. and therefore must be coping. But it's literally like a person being under such enormous stress that they just go into shock. Absolutely. That's and exactly then, what it is. 
that is so traumatizing. Yeah. But as this is what I mean is as like a lay person who doesn't know, you would think, oh, great, that problem's solved. And it's funny. That's another thing I wanted to ask you, because you do get quite a lot of conflicting advice. So on the one hand, you get the very kind of positive reward people who are like, you shouldn't do anything at all to put your dog under any amount of stress or any amount of um, domination over the dog or even leadership and terms like that are kind of they're saying oh we shouldn't use that it should all be treat based and reward based and fun based and game based and then on the other end of the spectrum you've got kind of the old school advice from people where they're like oh just you know you need to be able to to hit it to submit it and things and you need to be able to just flick it on the nose yeah. if it does something some really bad advice like when we had the other day about oh if your puppy's mouthing you shriek because then it thinks that you are also a puppy and you're in pain and I was like surely shrieking in your dog's in your puppy's face if it does something wrong it doesn't seem intuitively that helpful no. to me no so what do you think about all of that yeah I mean let's, that's like a whole another podcast um I mean look the, you know we know that there are lots of different opinions and you know what it's great to a degree how I learned was listening to all these opinions and people's experiences and then adding in my own gradually and, you know, and still listening and I still listen now and I still listen to everybody else's podcast as well as doing my own. I think that's really important. I mean, I think we don't need to be abusing our dogs. Fact. Things like alpha rolls and, you know, slamming your dog to the floor. It's just completely barbaric and unnecessary. I do think there's quite a lot of controversial consideration around treat work specifically um, and it's something that anyone around me will know that I'm quite passionate about trying to get people to understand when and how you're using treats and whether you're using them to bribe your dog which is what a lot of people are actually doing or whether you're using them as a positive lure towards getting good behaviors and actually marking those really good behaviors so I think I tend to go with the opinion that I'm looking at the individual dog to begin with, the age of that dog, the experiences of that dog. And what I try and do is put that animal in a position where I've already decided whether I feel that's something they can cope with or not. And if I don't feel they're coping, I do nothing other than remove them because this is a learning experience for them and it needs to remain a positive one. I think with regards pressure, pressure is a tricky one because pressure, again, comes down to perception i and what would pressure be well and this is the thing i think it's how you look at pressure do i have i had puppies who've put the brakes on and gone oh my goodness what was that and i've said come on let's go and you know clap my hands and said let's go we're gonna go and got their confidence and move them through a scenario absolutely is that pressure probably um is it forceful well, the dog is on a lead and collar, and I think uh, I don't I don't even want to go there because for me the whole force free free thing is very conflicting and confusing because you know unless you never have a collar and lead on your dog and never tell your dog not to do anything, then everybody to some degree is, is applying a bit of force to their animal. That's how we get our predators to conform and be good social pets. Like we have to put some degree of force or pressure on the situation. But does that come with conflict and aggression? Absolutely not. And I think that's the line that we're kind of, and I would really like to get out there. You know, people throwing these opinions around is damaging for people like you as a new dog owner coming into it. So yes, I go with my little treat bag and my little treat bag is on me all the time when I'm training a puppy. And I had a client the other day who uh, was talking to me about his French bulldog and he said, Joe, when he sees something new, he just sits down and watches he said, it's really frustrating. I was like, no, it's not. It's amazing. Reward it. That's what you're going to want when, you know, he's twice the size and he wants to greet everybody. But what he's got in his locker is he sees somebody and he puts his bottom on the floor first. Mm. Then he gets his confidence. Then you can get somebody to come over and say hi and watch his body language in return. Mm. What you never want is your dog dragging you over to another human or a child or another dog just to get a positive learning experience and then get them to reward it or not reward it. It might be negative. That's the worst thing possible. So all the rewards come from you in those early days. It's all about new environment, check in with me as an owner, let's go check it out because you're cool. Yeah. Or actually, you've checked in with me, but you haven't taken a treat. 
And I use treats a lot in this way. So I will just take a tiny little bit of whatever treat I'm using and offer it up to the dog in a certain situation. If the dog turns its head away and isn't interested, I've not got a dog on a platform that's willing to learn. Yeah. So we will retreat. So distance threshold is really important. That's the first thing that I do is look at the dog's ability to cope with distance threshold. I'll then have 10 or 15 tools in my box that I'll pick out and use. And that's why it's important to educate yourself. If you're just looking at one person's ideas, one person's opinions, as long as that person's got loads of things to offer, absolutely fine. But if they're just going down one avenue of we're going to do everything with food and nothing else including your dog stealing something and we're going to bribe that object off of your dog by using food, which is massively detrimental to the dog's learning, then you need to be looking elsewhere. So having the opportunity to educate yourself as a client and know what tool to use and when is probably the best top tip I can give, not just sticking in one lane. This is my tool this is what I'm going to use. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense because if you think about socialising a puppy, it's broken down, as, as you've said, into tiny little steps and literally baby steps to yep. get you to that point where, you're, where your dog goes through that mental process of being able to deal with that situation and becoming resilient to that. Absolutely. So it makes sense that you would not just use one technique throughout that entire process it would require lots of I mean there's so many different variables there'd be the environment they're in yep. there'd be how quickly they learn and and one of the other things I wanted to kind of cover also is obviously we're looking for a German Shepherd puppy and there's more pressure on us to um to get the puppy to a place where it's socially resilient because it's going to become a very large and powerful dog yep and also, you know, German Shepherds, are they predisposed to certain things? Like thinking about the breed of your dog and if that predisposition to certain behaviours would mean that socialisation is more difficult. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think um, I think people that, that get these breeds that have maybe got some sort of caveat around them, you know, or pre um, an expectation of how they are going to behave I think they're a lot more socially aware of getting their dog friendly and actually that awareness can be detrimental you know taking your puppy absolutely everywhere and overwhelming them just just you know treat my puppy get your pup get my puppy into your social situation you know that's they kind of some people go overkill shepherds are really sensitive dogs and they want to rule you know this whole thing about not giving dogs no and boundaries that's not positive We all need rules and boundaries. You know, I work for myself. I still work within the confines of my association and make sure I hit all their, you know, their their code of conduct and everything that goes with it. And my own moral code of conduct is still very, very high. So we all need these rules and boundaries in order to be able to feel like we're achieving stuff and that we are socially acceptable. You know, the better behave your dog is, the more praise you can give. I want to hear, yes, you're amazing, way more than no, don't do that. And that's not the case at all. So I think looking at taking what will potentially be a big, powerful dog um, that's very sensitive into a social environment, that's exactly the mentality you take outside. So if you see them doing anything as a puppy, add on another 30 kilos and you know adult teeth and decide if that behavior is still acceptable (laughs) and you know you mentioned resilience resilience is huge and massively misunderstood and not considered you know these these dogs are learning to be resilient within the confines of a human social situation not dogs it's easy when they're dogs to just learn how to be around other dogs it's not easy for them to learn to adapt to our ever-changing worlds so resilience does need to be the focus and your dog is not going to become resilient if you keep just chucking them into certain situations throwing in some scattered food on the floor and expecting that to be a lovely experience for them because for your German Shepherd it will absolutely not be how your German Shepherd will thrive is doing a buddy dog walk, is sitting on the outskirts of a public park. And obviously in the UK, we have very open public parks and lots of dogs free running. So we want that dog to be able to be sitting and just observing, observing all this stuff that's going on, observing the kids screaming and playing, 
just so that they get almost desensitized to it. And then they just periodically look at you and go, you know, is this all right? And you go, yeah, you're amazing. Bang. And we're still treat training. We're giving food. That's amazing. The minute they stop taking food, you change your plan. Yeah. This is not working for me anymore. Or I have many people say to me, my dog doesn't like food. Let's find something they do like. And if we can't do that in the social situation, let's take them home Mm. and find that favourite thing. Is it a toy? Is it a stuffed Kong? Is it a squeaky ball? Different toys evoke different experiences for dogs because of the sensory element to them. So, you know, a a squeaky ball might work for one dog, a fluffy toy might work for another, but you then add value to that object. And that's, what have I got? You know, this is only coming out when you're amazing. The other thing that I do, which works brilliantly for my big, powerful, energetic dogs, working dogs, is to let them sit and observe for a short period of time and then have a long line attached, obviously, but then chuck a ball out behind them away from the social event. So they can actually blow off a little bit of that kind of shut down excitement. They might be sitting there going, and I have, I've got dogs in a sit, stay, sit, stay and watch and, and literally watch them shaking with the adrenaline of oh my goodness, I'm I'm following this command and this is amazing, but I really want to get involved. If you just keep trying to shut that down, shut that down, you're going to end up with a dog that's going to explode. Yeah. So offering the opportunity for them to go out and chase something. Um, I'm just going to chuck in a different thought process here. I worked with a lady with a Thai Ridgeback, which is quite an unusual breed, but very strong-willed, powerful breed. No messing. You're not not treating this, this dog like you would a Maltese Terrier or something. You really are considering what will be the end result. And I did exactly that with this dog. And as she threw the ball, she ran with it. And the dog actually didn't quite attack her, but did go into prey drive mode and focused it on her. Now, fortunately, he was only five, six months at the time, but it was a real red flag. So that's not going to work for that dog. You know, we need to slow it down, stop it, right? We're not doing that. And I think... That journey is really important, getting to know your dog. If she'd have looked at advice online and actually done some of the things that's out there, she'd be in a whole heap of trouble now. But by systematically working through that dog's perception of social situations and what he wanted to do, which is to basically chase and flatten something, and because she stopped him doing it with the other dogs, he redirected it on her. You know, if you're sitting at home thinking, yeah, this is all great and lovely, but, you know, my dog goes mental. Marley, my doodle, goes mental around food. Could not take any treat training out at all. He would be a complete lunatic. Too much for him. I had to go down actually to just, good boy. Yeah, That's all I could do because any energy I added would just send him into the stars. <laughs> so, you know, it, it is all... It's it's a it's great learning curve to Marley Dog. Um, so I think, you know, there are lots and lots of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that you take out. And the reason for this podcast is to allow people that sense of it's whatever you're dealing with, it's okay, as long as you're being mindful that, yeah. you know, you're going to get a puppy and you're, you're, got, you're picking your puppy up next week. Yes, you may need to factor going in back to work, um, but you need to be setting that puppy up to cope with time without you when you're in the house first. You need to be setting that puppy up to cope if you're taking the dog to work or people come to your house for work. You need to be setting your puppy up to be able to cope with that. So it's not just a case of like people do when they have a baby, you know, stay at home and learn what the hell you're doing, how to breastfeed, how to do this, and then the grandparents might pop over, but you don't want to see anyone and spend your time in pyjamas. No, when you get, oh, I didn't do that, actually. (laughs) I was out socialising. I didn't know what I was doing with my children, so I just trained them like dogs and they're great. (laughs) It's all fine. Um, So I think, you know, when you get a puppy, that is a period of time that you invest to understand them, to yeah. learn their communication, to understand your individual dog. It's not going to be like any other litter mates because everybody else on WhatsApps and Facebook pages, they'll they'll be doing their thing in their environments. So don't get too hit up on, oh, but my puppy's not doing that yet. Yeah. Just focus on your puppy's journey and understanding what makes them tick and mm-hmm. delivering that for all the good behaviour. Um limitations rules boundaries give them all of these things very simply with with just real clarity and real positive awareness because they love it a boundary is not negative 
A boundary gives them chance to adjust. It gives them chance to assess a situation. It gives them chance to learn about people. It gives them chance to use their nose, which mm. is massive. So for me to just stop a dog as we walk through a doorway, just put my hand signal up and ask them to wait while I go through, is probably the difference between a calm, well-behaved dog entering an environment as opposed to a dog that's going to cause chaos. Yeah. Since working with you, we've realised that we have to invest a certain amount of time into setting up the puppy and making sure that they are ready to cope with this. So investing that time is important and not getting your advice online. Like, you know, I used to love watching videos of, of kids and babies and things and how sweet it was oh if they were with puppies or dogs and huskies, you know, huskies seem to be the big one with kids and oh, our, our husky is lying in with our, mm. our baby or look at how the baby treats the puppy. And suddenly since working with you, I've looked at them and I thought that's so dangerous yeah. yeah it's really unfair and you know the podcast that we did with Ross we were talking about the loss of you know the values really around how amazing our dogs are and that they're just not respected enough I mean I think really if you were able to read everything you need to read and speak to enough people you would never get a puppy because yeah. the chances of you get it wrong that's that's what I was saying about getting mine you know I'm at a stage now I think oh my god the pressure <laughs> Hogan's so amazing and I kind of hit the ground running with him we were doing a lot of filming and stuff and now I know even more than I knew six years ago and you know you do get to a stage where you just think oh god I don't even know if I can do this of course I can do it but you just you just know how much can go wrong um you know they're very forgiving my breeder is amazing and she's kind of my balancer and says stop overthinking everything yeah. you know stop applying all the all your science that's great for individual cases but actually I know what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day, you know level and I know what to look out for it's never an easy task but it's massively rewarding if you do allocate the time to bringing them up well and remembering that they're a dog and actually taking the time to look how dogs interact with each other. They don't have hours of verbal conversations. You know, they use a lot of body language cues. They have lots and lots of time out. I said in one of my other podcasts about sleep deprivation, you know, that's never more important than when you get your puppy. They need time away from you as a family mm. in order to grow and recharge their batteries. And again, that's something that I correct as high priority when I go in because most puppies are awake for far too long. Yeah. And you know yourself, if you're tired and awake, again, you're pulling on all those stress chemicals just to keep you going because otherwise you just crash and burn. Mm. So it's a really negative place for puppies to be if they're not settled into a routine. I think also as a, as a dog owner, you have this kind of emotional it sounds so stupid because it's like it's just a dog but you have this emotional battle going through things like training you know for resilience or eat those social situations as well and it can be a bit embarrassing for people if they come over and the puppy's acting up or whatever you go through this huge emotional struggle a lot of the time where it's just so hard to put things into place when you love that little verbal so much it's just so adorable yeah. and you're like I just can't I you know having to tell it no or hearing it cry when you've got it in a crate can be really tough but the enjoyment that you get later on with the dog is so much more vast being able to let it off the lead and yeah. trusting that you can have people over and it'll be fine it's so much more rewarding once you've done that groundwork and gone through that initial kind of tough yeah. stage yeah absolutely and I mean I think you know you mentioned the lead stuff training them off the, the lead from day one that's my thing you know yeah. dogs want they want freedom they want to be able to freely come back to you get something amazing and then go again and if you develop that organic relationship which is exactly what I did with hoax you know I I don't because I don't would never take any risk with him at all. But I can happily walk along a main road on a pavement with Hogan completely off lead. Yeah. And he would not move. I won't take that risk. I will not. I don't think I need to trust my training to the detriment of him. But his relationship with me, I can pull him off a monk jack. If there's a monk jack pops up and starts running, you know, even though he's a retrieval dog, I can stop him. I can stop him off a pheasant. I can literally do that because from day one, I knew that was going to be something he would, could potentially be over social as a Labrador. He was definitely going to have a prey drive because he's a working gun dog. So from that very first day of eight weeks old, I worked that every single day. Yeah. Stop, sit and watch. Birds, rabbits, horses. 
let's find some sheep, cars, you know, bicycles, let's go run. So he'd watch a bit and then we'd go and have a game. Mm. And, you know, I knew the innate drives that were going to be strong in him. So I used them to my advantage. Mm. So I think that gifted period is hugely overlooked. People don't really start training until it goes wrong. And so for you, for me to have anybody like you that comes to me early or invest in any kind of advice from a a qualified behavior practitioner, and you need a behavior practitioner, your dog training is great. And there's nothing wrong with socialization with, with a good dog training class. But you need somebody that understands the psychology around the dog and the innate drives and the different uh, breed predispositions that are prevalent because it's those instinctive drives that get people into trouble. Mm. And if you are getting your socialization wrong or it comes in way too late, you're going to find you're in trouble pretty quickly. We will definitely be looking at your shepherd from uh, a perspective of impulse control. Yeah creating good, positive social experiences with her or his sensitivities in mind because they're quite strong working dogs. They like to know what's coming next. Yes. So we'll be watching the general behaviours that the, that your puppy individually delivers when he or she is in certain scenarios with you when they're happy, when they're playing, and then how does that transfer to a guest coming in are they showing a little bit more caution? Do we need to get a settle mat down and be using a Kong with some treats in it? The, the puppy's just in the room for a short period of time while you've got a guest present and then we remove them. Or have we got a dog that we can actually take out and actively start socialising really well and just having them in, you know, just sat outside a cafe? I wouldn't be letting people approach my puppy. Maybe mm. approach the table and talk to you and you can drop treats but I wouldn't be letting people touch my puppy underneath a, a, a table for, as its first experience. So it's all kind of organically done, but with really clever controls in place so that the learning comes f- with your direction. So that's what we'll be looking to do. Depending on the strength of your dog's working drive, we will look for outlets for that too, because that's the best way to train a dog is to give them what they love to do. We're not going to be looking at bite sleeves for your dog. <laughs> We're sending Shepherd down that route. But we can channel that energy into even some retrieval work yeah. or something similar. So I think we are just going to ensure that you're as educated as you can possibly be and set up to hit the ground running so you're not trying to learn whilst you've got this cute little bundle of fluff in front of you. Yeah, So I hope that helps, Emma. Yes, thank Looking you forward so to meeting much. him or her. And um, I guess that concludes today's podcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you're interested in reading any more about socialisation, you can pick up my Puppy Coach book either from the website, puppycoach.com, or it is also available on Amazon. Any questions, feel free to fire them over. And I hope you enjoyed today's session. Take care.